Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week we're gonna talk about Comcast Gigabit Pro again, because it looks like my bandwidth woes will soon be over. My order is placed, it has been confirmed, things are moving, and we've got somebody on the show today who has this super high speed service and is gonna do some show and tell for us. Let's get to it. Now, if you haven't heard of Gigabit Pro before, this is a high-end internet product for residential customers from Comcast. It is fiber to the home, it's multi-gigabit, and it costs about 300 bucks a month. Not cheap, and yes, you can get fiber products in other parts of the country for less, but where I am, this is the only way I can get my internet problems solved where I live. And I've tried everything, trust me, we've talked about it before. Uh, my issues really have been around uploading, uh, both the speed of my uploads, which have been maxed down at 12 megabits per second on the current Comcast network where I live, and we've also had reliability issues with live streaming, where we get knocked off every 10 minutes or so, and it's been very frustrating dealing with both of those issues, and hopefully this investment will be worth it because we definitely have been not as productive as we could be given some of our issues. And I'm excited now because the order has been placed. It is happening. I got my text message to confirm it. It will be in before December 31st, but because this is a very unique product, uh, every order is treated a little differently than it might be for just regular cable modem service. And I wanted to bring on somebody I met through a blog post I stumbled across the other day by the name of Kirk Schnabel. I hope that's the way I pronounce his name. I'll find out for sure in a second. And he's got a great post on uh, the Binary Impulse site detailing the installation of the product and its performance. And what we're gonna do now is bring Kirk on and have him give us a overview of the service, how it's working for him a year later, do some show and tell and see how fast it is too. Let's bring him on. All right, so joining me now is Kirk Schnabel, the uh, guy I was just talking about who posted that awesome blog page about the process of getting hooked up with Gigabit Pro. So Kirk, I want to first talk about uh, your, your reasoning for going with this. Now, my issues have been upload. You've been following my plight a little bit on some of the mm -hmm. videos that you've come across on YouTube. What was your reason for, for wanting to go with the gusto here? Uh, my reason was similar. Uh, it was also upload. Uh, prior to Gigabit Pro, I actually was not a Comcast customer. I had been, but when they brought the one terabyte cap to my area, I left them for another cable company. And the cable company that I had service with was starting to deteriorate, and they were beginning to outsource their support and move all their staff out of the state, and there really wasn't any escalation path anymore. And when they started having network issues and I started having reliability problems with my Twitch stream and things like that because of the signal noise on the RF on the coax and there was nothing I could do about it that got really frustrating and that sounds uh, familiar <laughs> uh-huh and I had with the other cable company I had 50 up and I really didn't want to go back to 3540 on the Comcast gigabit plan I really wanted to have more than 50 so you know it's it's kind of funny but it turns out that it's cheaper to go 2 gig by 2 gig than anything else cuz everything else is you know, a different SL, a different service level and cost more money. So how did you get it? Did you have to call up the customer service? I had, I had a call many times over the course of a year and a half to finally find the right person. Was it hard to get to the right person there? It wasn't too hard actually for me. I posted on the slash r slash Comcast underscore Xfinity subreddit. And uh, that if you're not familiar with that, that's a support channel Comcast has kind of like their Twitter. Uh, it's really declined in the last year or two, unfortunately, especially now with the pandemic, the response times there are just abysmal, but for a while they were a really good support channel. And I posted asking about it and I actually got a phone call from the person who became my account manager, got a direct extension and everything. So I know it's not easy to do, but I got really lucky getting in touch with the right person. Now this is, you're in the IT business, so, so you know some of the tech behind this. This is something called a Metro E connection. Um, how yes. is that different than, than like your run of the mill fiber product that you might get from an ISP? Well, if you have a residential fiber, you probably have GPON. There's a couple other technologies, but similar to cable, similar to DSL, you have kind of a shared residential hub that has its own set of limitations. And uh, Metro E is a much more dedicated connection. It's the kind of connection that you'd expect 
at an enterprise level. Like it's the kind of connection that a school would have or a hospital would have or a library would have. Um, kind of the modern equivalent to a T1 line 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, really? So this is like, this is more than just like a, like a fiber to the home kind of thing. This is, I'm, I'm going to get like enterprise level stuff here. I'm well, my, my, under, my understanding <laughs> is in some markets, they are starting to GPON gigabit pro sort of. It's not mm -hmm. GPON because I think GPON tops out at like 1.2 gigabit. So they can't do two gigabit. And GPON on it, is but... what kind of like a shared connection. Is that, is that the best way to describe it? It's, it's very comparable to like a cable node. It's a shared type connection. Uh, it's what like Verizon Fios and ISPs like that, they would use a, a technology like that. So there'd be a hub in the neighborhood that would be distributing bandwidth in a shared way. Uh, not, not that you wouldn't get your full speed probably, but it's not nearly as dedicated. Um, talking to my technician who installed my service in particular, I, like I said, I think it's different in some markets because especially the newer construction where Comcast is rolling out fiber to the home now, I think by default in a lot of cases. Um, for me, my fiber connection, as far as I was told, and I have no reason to think it's not true, uh, my fiber connection is a direct connection to the distribution hub for my town. It's about three, four miles away. It's got like a big tower outside to receive TV signals and stuff like that. And uh, that's where the core router is for my area. That's where all of the cable nodes connect back to. So the understanding I have is there's a 10 gig optic in that core router for me and wow. I'm hooked up just like the cable nodes. What yep. we're going to do right now is uh, right now we're, uh, we're going to overlay some video you're going to shoot of the speed test because um, we didn't want to show your IP for the viewers. So we're, we're taking a look at that now. Uh, typically right. what, you're getting the full two gigs all the time, both directions? Yeah, typically I get anywhere between like 1900 and 2100 megabit. I, it's actually provisioned for 2.2, so you can actually burst a little bit over two gig. That's not bad at all. And then in addition to that, um, from what I saw from your blog post, uh, the the latency is very low on this too. The latency is incredibly low. I get about a two millisecond ping to Google. That's uh, nine hops out on my trace route. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's almost like having your own private backbone to some degree, I guess. Not not quite, but close to it. It, it really is. I, I, I work in a data center, network operations center, and I'm a hundred feet away from racks and racks of servers. And my internet at home is faster than my internet at work because my in, the office network is only one gigabit. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, what's interesting, and I read this on your post, is that um, you, you found that it's not just the two gigabit connection, though. You actually have two separate connections coming in. Is that right? Yes. So when they install Gigabit Pro, they set up that Juniper for you, and they give you two methods of connecting to it. They give you one Ethernet port. There's a number of Ethernet ports on it, but I don't think any of the other ones are configured for anything. They configure one to be your Ethernet uplink and then they configure one SFP port to be your fiber uplink. And there's nothing at all preventing you from using both concurrently. Now, one of the things that you offered to do for the viewers at home is to take us on a tour of your, of your data center in your house down there. Um, so we're gonna yeah. take a quick respite here and flip you over to your phone and we're gonna go down to your basement uh, where this stuff lives. And we'd love to take a look and see what you got hooked up down there. All right, Kirk, we're in your basement and you're on your mobile phone. So we're going to be using its microphone. So we'll get your, uh, your nicer mic back when you go back upstairs. Uh, so what are we looking at here? This is the Comcast rack, right? Yeah, so this is my Comcast rack. Uh, they did not supply this. This is my cabinet. But if we open the door here, we've got their fiber termination panel where they brought the fiber in from outside and uh, their Juniper. And as you can see, I'm using now tell me about this, uh, both of the on the Juniper here. Yeah, now this Juniper, this is this is their their equipment. And so you've got this fiber coming equipment. in, and that goes into one of those SFP ports on there? Correct. So their fiber comes in. It terminates here in this Comcast panel. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually ran six pairs, so I have some extra pairs. We're only using two. Mm -hmm. So if there's ever a problem or they want to do some kind of upgrade down the road or something, there's more pairs of fiber available that are already here. Um, Juniper, which is nice dual power supplies. Uh, there's this Ethernet port here, which is my one gigabit uplink. Then there's the two SFPs over here. The uh, one with the blue fiber is going to my edge router, and the one with the yellow fiber is going to the Comcast patch panel. So down here we have my edge router Infinity, which uh, you can see I have several ports active on. Um, I have the port here, which comes from Comcast. Then I have this uh, Ethernet port here, which goes to my PoE switch for a separate network that 
runs my security cameras because uh, now that I have all this bandwidth, I decided to do live real-time off-site recording. So rather than have that dirtying up my bandwidth graphs and keeping my fiber loaded, I ran this Ethernet cable dedicated to that traffic. Wow. And then and here don't we charge, see we they have- don't, They uh, don't have a, a bandwidth cap on this, right? No bandwidth cap, none whatsoever. Oh, good. <laughs> so <laughs> I know, right? So uh, then here we have uh, the ports that go to my two networks. I have two separate networks set up that are distinct from each other. One is for my server equipment and my lab stuff, and one is for the rest of the house. And then there's this Ethernet cable here, which is the uh, one gig port to the Juniper. So I run both ports to the edge router Infinity. Now Comcast supplied this uh, wireless router that I've never opened that I'm just <laughs> storing here for them. It's a nice one at least, that, but still, uh, it's like an off-the-shelf. It's funny, they bring in all this big iron equipment and then they hand you like an off-the-shelf router to run everything from, right? I know, that is, that is a bit surprising, isn't it? <laughs> and, th and that's not yours, right? That's theirs. You, gotta, you're renting, you, ha you're, you have to rent that, right? That's, that's theirs. That's a rental. So that's why I'm just kind of keeping it here with their stuff. And, uh, you know, when uh, the time comes, if I ever have to return that, then I've got it here for them. Wow. But... Uh, if you want here, I can show you the uh, actual fiber line. So yeah. the actual fiber line comes in through this orange conduit. I also have some yellow ones, which are my own fibers. So they just came in with the orange conduit here, right from the outside. And uh, they ran me, they left me a little bit extra as like a service loop, but this thick cable here is actually my fiber. It comes out of the orange conduit and the, my service loop loops around and then comes back and comes down into my cabinet. And that actually and, and goes to the back of the patch panel. And does that wire essentially run all the way back to that, cent that central place that you, that you talked about earlier? That wire runs to the utility pole on the main street by my okay. house. That Got wire it. is the wire that they ran. That wire is the wire that they'll run up to like three quarters of a mile or a third of a mile or whatever their mm -hmm. uh, distance restraint is. Now you've got some other stuff to show me. So why don't we uh, take a look at what else you've got? And, and uh, we've talked about doing these data center tours, these home data center tours on the channel for a while. And this is great. So you got a lot of, I mean, you got quite a setup there. <laughs> so what do we have over here? <laughs> Thank you. So this is uh, one of the two fibers comes to this cabinet. This is my residential side of the network, my home side of the network. Uh, so in here, when I moved into this house, the first thing I did was run a ton of Ethernet cable. It looks so like it. So <laughs> all of my Ethernet cable, yes, yeah, so all of my Ethernet cable comes back to these patch panels. I decided from day one that I wanted to have all completely centralized switching. So I don't use any switches throughout the house. Everything, every, every room has a wall jack and every wall jack comes back here. So, you got so a home run that to way every everything room. was, yes, I did runs to the second floor, first floor. I even have runs to the garage. I have an eight port patch panel in the garage at, in the uh, rafters, which runs some of my security cameras and uh, you know, anything that I might want to do in the garage. But uh, I decided on doing that from day one because I wanted the ability to have this UPS down here powering everything so that my internet would not be interrupted by power issues and I wouldn't have to worry about having UPSs anywhere that I had a switch or anything like that. I wanted right. everything centralized. That and sense. that turned out to work out really, really well for me because I'm now running 10 gig on some of these. These three blue cables here are my three computers upstairs that have 10 gigabit ethernet coming into my 10 gigabit switch here. So like my gaming computer and uh, my primary workstation and my DJ computer for that side of the streaming setup, that all comes down here. That's how I get my 10 gigabit. I'm doing it just over Cat6 um, for those computers. Very cool. So patch panels here, which go back to the uh, jacks in the rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my old Edge Router 8 Pro, which I haven't removed yet because it's kind of buried in here and I might <laughs> yeah, still yeah. use it for something down the road. Uh, this is my, my setup here is pretty much all ubiquity. This is an mm -hmm. EdSwitch 48 Lite, which is uh, all of my one gig ports. So a lot of my ports I didn't bother upgrading because you can't have 10 gig everywhere. Not everything's even capable of using it. Right. So for things like Chromecasts and you know anything like that where I don't care, or wall jacks that aren't really in use but are there for future use, things like that are all hooked up to this uh, one gigabit switch, which I ran two DAC cables here to give this a 20 gig uplink to my 10 gig switch, which connects wow. back to the edge router. And what's funny about this um, stuff so is that people, that, don't realize, um, people don't realize, people don't realize that to make use of the internet connection you have, you need a significant in-home upgrade just to be able to get yes. beyond a gigabit, right? Exactly. 
And the vast majority of my ports here still don't go beyond a gigabit. All of these ports are one right, gigabit, but gigabit. it's completely fine. Yeah, that's Very completely cool. fine. They don't all have to be multi-gig. So then down here, I have a EdSwitch 24 500 watt, which is running my uh, surveillance cameras, which I have, I think, eight of. Ubiquity also, the Unify video product. Now this, unfortunately, does not have SFP+. Plus, so I just did these two short little cables here, and this has a two gig bonded uplink to the 48 port switch. So this shares the 20 gig with the 48 port switch. But since this is two gig bonded, if I had an access point, you know, the access point is still going to be on a gigabit port, but between two access points with multiple wireless clients, I could still potentially go over one gigabit, but right. not on one single client. So then down here is a Edge Switch 16XG, which is my 10 gigabit distribution switch. This has uh, two fiber cables here. One goes to the Edge, or the Edge Router Infinity, and the other one, um, actually this one here goes to the Edge Router Infinity, my mistake. These two are a 20 gigabit link to the server rack for inter-VLAN routing, so that doesn't go through the Edge Router. Then these two DACs here for the uh, 48 port switch. And then I have these three here, which are direct connections for Ethernet to computers. And I have a couple more Ethernet ports here that I could expand to. I got another uh, module here. And I have a couple extra modules also that I keep in the other cabinet. And then, of course, up here, I just have all my little stuff. I have two uh, Google Voice lines here. Oh, I got those. And, those, uh, are those, um, those are those boxes. What do they call the those? The uh... OB200. OB, OB yeah, that's right. Yep, they're great. And then I've got uh, this thing here, which is a Effergy Engage Hub which is like my own electric smart meter so that I can see real-time readings of my electric usage for my main panel. And uh, yeah. this is just a Raspberry Pi, which uh, I actually use this for uh, a relay for broadcast traffic so that my Chromecast can work across VLANs because right. my Chromecasts are on an IoT VLAN and my computers are on another VLAN. And in order for them to talk right, to each other, you need a, uh, you need a broadcast <laughs> relay. So, uh, Kirk, what do, we, what do we got here? It looks like you got a lot of storage. We have a lot of storage. Uh, everything here is kind of still a work in progress, but, I mean, it's a home lab, right? So that's, that's how it goes. Yeah. So uh, up here I have some spare switches. I have a spare Edge Switch 16 for my other network, and that's very expensive to have, but I would mm -hmm. not want that to fail and have no option or what to do. So got my spare for the switch. Uh, I got a spare Nexus here. You're going to see the other Nexus on the back here shortly. Uh, so this this is one of my storage servers. It looks like a real beast, but actually there's only nine drives in it right now. The rest of this is future expansion. Um, I kind of use this for my ephemeral storage, so things that change frequently. Mm -hmm. So like when I'm streaming on Twitch and I want to locally record, I would locally record to this server. Okay. Um, when I want to manage my music collection, my music collection is on this server. Things that change frequently. You do a lot of DJing, so uh, you have quite a collection. Yes, I do. I DJ, so I have quite a lot of music. And uh, I also, I'm not sure if I'm ever going to do anything with it, but I have recordings of all of my DJ streams for the last, like, probably year. And uh, like to archive that sort of stuff, too. But archival happens down here on this second file server, which you can also see this has a lot of trays out. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because I'm in the process of converting from smaller drives to bigger drives to expand without building another server. So these are trays that are empty that used to have drives in them. I've consolidated everything into these uh, 12 drives here. Um, this file server down here is a mirrored replica of the one above it. Ah, okay. And uh, it's actually off right now. And I did that so that I could get away from RAID. And that will allow me to save 50% of my power because I don't have to have two sets of drives spinning. Right. So I have single drives here. These are just eight terabyte drives mm -hmm. that I store things on. And once or twice a month, I turn this on and rsync everything. And that's why this server is my server for things that change because this server has RAID and this server is for archival and it's for more cold storage. So everything that's on here just gets rsynced here periodically. I used to do RAID, but I had a couple of instances where I had gigantic RAIDs that had failures and were having problems rebuilding, and it's just much easier to manage it this way for me. I know I'm probably going to catch a lot of flack for that in the comments. <laughs> I don't, listen, if but, anyone gives you flack for that setup, they can, they can have at it. Because, <laughs> and you know what, I think it, it, it comes down to what works best for you, right? And, and, and it seems like that's a much simpler way to manage the problem, and you save money on power, so why not do it? Uh, down here is my hypervisors. 
Uh, these are a little bit of a, a little bit of an older generation equipment. I got all this stuff on eBay. Uh, these are DL three eighty G fives from HP. And, and by uh, hypervisors, for... we're talking about um, virtual machines. Like it's a virtual machine server. Is yes. That... Yep. Yes, I use these for virtual machine hypervisors. These run. Uh, I'm running VMware ESXi, the free version right now, mm -hmm. but I'm moving toward Proxmox. I have uh, VMware on this guy down here, and Proxmox on here that I'm testing. This is a DL380G7. This is my production hypervisor right now, uh, and it will stay my production hypervisor, but I might move to Proxmox soon. Yeah, I have a lot of virtual machines here because I run uh, Nextcloud. Um, I, I pretty much try not to do anything directly on the file server. So if I have any services that use the files on the file server, I run them in VMs. Got so it. like for Nextcloud, my Nextcloud data is up here on the ephemeral storage server, but my Nextcloud virtual machine with Apache and everything is on the hypervisor in a VM. And those are easy um, to back up too. If you ever had a problem, you could just back up the, the, the virtual machine and restore it and you're back up exactly. and running pretty quickly. And yeah. I, I, I like that there's nothing on the hypervisor really that's that valuable anyway. All that's on the hypervisor is configs because all the data is on storage servers and that makes it, I don't know, seem a little bit more secure to me. It seems a little easier to take care of. I don't have to worry about what's on the VM. There's nothing on the VM. Yeah, so in the back here, I'll show you the uh, connectivity. So uh, each file server, which remember there's three of them, right. each file server has two 10 gig uplinks, which are direct attached copper. And for the file servers, I bonded them. So the file servers have 20 gigabits per second to each server. So uh, if you recall earlier, I mentioned I have two fibers running between this network and my residential side. Mm -hmm. And then I have one fiber running between this network and the edge router to provide this with internet connectivity. This is a completely separate physical network, but it's a little, become a little bit less separate. It used to be much more separate. Now I do more like VLANs and inter-VLAN routing. But the gateway for this network is this fiber, and the gateway for the other network is its own fiber. So that way, this network's activity and the communication between this network and the other network don't saturate that line and affect the internet speed. It gives me a little more uh, internal bandwidth. And since uh, this is 20 gig and this is 20 gig, theoretically, if I had storage fast enough, which I don't, I could possibly pull a file at a full 10 gigabits per second on two client computers in my house at the same time. Oh, wow. So not going to be running out of internal bandwidth anytime soon, no, but this was definitely like a feat to uh, implement. Right. So originally I started this rack with an edge switch 16 XG, but I quickly outgrew that. I have uh, 12 direct attached cables here because I have two to every server. And then I have these three fibers over here. So, I quickly outgrew the uh, Edge Switch 16 XG, so I have a Nexus 3064 here that I got on eBay. Surprisingly, even though this is a 48 port 10 gig switch with 4X QSFP 40 gigabit uplinks, which I'm not using yet, um, it was actually cheaper because I bought it used than the uh, Edge Switch 16. <laughs> I, I recently, uh, I recently, I used to run this off of. Uh, whatever electrical circuit was around here. But recently I had some electrical work done. And one of the things that I had done was I had a dedicated outlet with a dedicated 20 amp breaker put in just for the server rack. So you probably I've need got that. plenty of power here now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what I did with my power is I put it all on the top of the rack now because everything's on the ceiling. So I have this trip light line conditioner to try to make sure that my power is nice and clean. And then I have uh, two UPSs here, UPS one and UPS two. Uh, we can see what the load is. Got about 650 watts on this one, and uh, you know, I think I have the same one. Also, in about my... 650 watts on this one. So I have the same one in in my my rack room. And just to give you an idea as to how much how much different our setups are, I think I'm at maybe 75 watts total right now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So well, I know, don't feel I don't I don't feel worthy here, but this is this is a heck of a setup, my friend. <laughs> some of it's some of it's the old equipment, though. If I had newer yeah. generation stuff, right, it would, would be, be more power, a lot less power. So, Kirk, I think if you were to pick the ideal customer for Gigabit Pro, I think you would be it. 
And I was telling you offline as we were getting settled back in here that I was so proud of myself. I bought this little rack for my room over there because now I've got like rack mounted stuff. And I was so proud of myself to have this little rack and you've got right. this data center down there. It looks awesome. So you are a Twitch streamer. You were talking a little bit about doing some of that. Um, what's yeah. your Twitch channel all about? What do you do there? Uh, so my channel, uh, twitch.tv slash UFG Kirk. Uh, my channel is primarily actually a DJ channel. Uh, I started DJing like a little over two years ago, just kind of as something interesting to do because I wanted a hobby that I could enjoy that would be a little bit disconnected from technology. And I guess that's as far away as I get. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that happening. So, but, well, hey, uh, at least you got the connection now to do it. So I'm sure your viewers appreciate yes. that. What bit well, rate do you, do you stream out at now? Unfortunately, Twitch's maximum is eight megabits per second. Oh, so I can't, okay. go any, I can't go any higher than that. It, I, I can, but you'll start to have a lot of issues. They'll start to force you to have, have a lower quality setting and stuff like that. It's just, it's easier to keep it at about uh, 7,700 K because otherwise Twitch starts to have uh, issues. Uh, I, I mix a lot of different kinds of music. I like to play like house music and electro pop remixes, usually like the first half of the night while I'm kind of warming up. And then the second half of the night, I'll do like dubstep and hard style and trap. Okay. And it's really funny because I, if I was to compare my two styles, it's like I start out the night like a house DJ, like Tiesto kind of DJ. And then I go to like spaghetti, <laughs> you know, kind of like dubstep DJ. But like, it's really, it's really all, it's really all a lot of fun. Uh, I also DJ for some virtual reality nightclubs, which is really oh, interesting. Kidding. Oh, that's cool. I found out that was a thing when they uh, asked me to to work with them. But perfect for COVID nineteen era, right? <laughs> it's so. perfect, and I was actually doing it pre COVID nineteen. But uh, people go into VR chat, put on their VR headsets, and uh, they bring in DJs, and they have time slots just like a real venue would, and they bring in uh, different DJs with different kinds of music performance styles, and they dance in VR chat, and it's really wow. cool. That's very cool. Well, I know I'm keeping you from your uh, your your time because usually it's Sunday night when you do this. So I don't want to keep you for much longer. But I really appreciate yeah. you showing us your entire setup down there. I think there's going to be a lot of jealous viewers out there. And I have been <laughs> um, I've been asking though for some of my viewers. I know a lot of my viewers have these crazy Plex setups. So now I yeah. know I'm going to get a few of them to like say, hey, let me let me show you mine. So I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to doing some of these data center tours and these home data center tours. Uh, rolling forward and I am too embarrassed now to share mine so hopefully I'll share some others and we'll go from there but I want to thank you for all of your time tonight I really appreciate it you give me some good things to be uh, looking forward to uh, when my Comcast yes. guy shows up and uh, we're not working for the company we're paying them our, our or we'll be paying them my 300 and something bucks a month um, but it's something that that we both need so I'm, I'm glad that uh, we're able to get hooked up there so Kirk thank you very much for uh, stopping by and uh, Everyone check Pleasure him out. To be here. Thank you. And check him out on Twitch. So I want to thank Kirk for coming on the show today to tell us all about his connection. And hopefully my connection will be just like his very, very shortly. I'm getting more and more excited now as things are getting closer to fruition here, which is going to be great. Now, this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. And we had a live stream the other day, which of course was interrupted by my ongoing cable modem problems. Uh, but we did get a super chat on that live stream from Ken Driggers II. I want to thank him for his contribution there. We also have some new supporters here on the channel who contributed via the YouTube membership program. They are Hand Color, Michael K, and Jimmy Keith. I want to thank everyone who contributed to the channel this week and everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and everyone who watches on an ongoing basis too because all of those things equal channel growth and a little later this week we'll be updating the credit rolls with all of the latest contributors to the channel as of August 1st. So stay tuned, those will be up very shortly. Now, if you want to contribute to the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We also, of course, support that YouTube membership program and you can join just by clicking the join button right below this video. So let's take a look now at the week in review on the live streams this week. We only did one. I was a little tied up. We've been getting ready to reopen the schools here locally. And as you know, I'm on the school board. We've had a bunch of meetings going on. So that's been kind of the priority, but we did do one live stream and we uh, were playing around with the shadow service, which is a cloud service where you can basically spin up your own Windows 10 computer inside of a data center. 
It's got an NVIDIA GPU on it, so it's similar in some ways to some of these game streaming services out there, and that's what they're billing themselves as. But you get access to the whole computer running Windows 10, so there's more to it than just gaming. And what I was going to do was shoot the whole review and live stream my workflow with it. I ran into some problems with it that were mostly caused by me. Um, so it was kind of me just fiddling around trying to get everything working. So we're going to repeat that live stream. And what I'll probably do is uh, just record a bunch of B-roll during that stream and then record the review a little later this week. So I'm hoping to do that probably tomorrow, Tuesday or Wednesday. So set your notification bell and you'll be notified when that stream happens. It's whenever I get it going during the day here. It's a really cool service, so I hope to uh, really uh, share that experience with you uh, throughout the week. Uh, on the Extras channel, we didn't get anything done this week, but we'll have some unboxings hopefully a little later this week. And then on the main channel, I only got two videos up this week, partly because of scheduling and recovery from that horrible power outage we went through, uh, but also because I screwed up the scheduling on YouTube when you go to publish videos and I got my whole every other day thing out of whack. So we only had two going up this week, uh, but they were good ones, I thought. Uh, we looked at the Lenovo ThinkPad T14S. One of them had an Intel processor inside and the other one had an AMD chip. We looked at two together and guess which one was faster? Yes, the AMD was certainly a much better performing computer for around the same money and we talk about all the differences between them in that review. We also took a look at the WISE Outdoor Camera, which is a new product from WISE. You might be familiar with their very inexpensive indoor security cameras. This one is designed to work outside, and it's very similar actually to the Blink cameras that Amazon has been selling for a while. And I like the Blink cameras quite a bit, and I like the WISE better than the Blink actually. And in the review, I think a lot of people who were critical of my take on this camera didn't see that I was really looking at it in the lens of what the Blink camera is versus something that's more robust as a security system. And I think I probably should have made it more clear in the video. Um, again, I really felt it was a better product than Blink, um, but it's not going to be a better product than the WISE indoor camera for constant surveillance. That camera is continuously powered. This one is running off a battery and is more limited, and it's certainly not going to be better than a camera that you would buy specifically for security surveillance. These are more security slash notification cameras, and under that lens, I think it's a pretty good product and, again, a little better than the Blink system. Now, this week on the channel, we've got a couple of things prepared. Uh, one is this video that was going to go up, but again, I screwed up the scheduling, the Logitech G9 15 TKL keyboard. If you go on Amazon, you'll see my review on the product listing. I hope to get to the Dell XPS 15 this week. We might get to it this week, but maybe next week. And the reason is I just got in two Acer laptops that are relatively low cost, powered by AMD Ryzen processors. And one of them's got a GPU on board for like $50 more. So depending on uh, where Jake is on the preparation on those two, I might get to those first, but the XPS 15 is definitely coming up. And we'll have that review of the Shadow Streaming Service. Again, I'm really pleased with it, and I've been doing a lot more than just gaming on it. And I actually did some useful things with it over the last two weeks with our school board meetings, and I'll talk all about that when we do the full review of that. Now, if you want to be notified every time I upload a video or go live, you can click on that notification bell and you'll be notified uh, when those things occur. We have other channels you can check me out on, including my extras channel for unboxings and supplementary content. We've got my live streams at the link you see here. That's the archive. And then we've got my Amazon page where you can follow me there as well. And we're going live on Amazon every time we go live on YouTube. And soon we're going to start offering discounts on products on Amazon during the live stream. So that's going to be a new thing we're going to start doing. Uh, so definitely sign up and follow me on that Amazon shop link. If it doesn't let you follow, let me know. But I'm pretty sure there's a follow link there because you're going to be able to get some good deals in the near future. Now, if you want to engage with the channel, you can sign up on my email list at lon.tv slash email. You can go to my Facebook group, which is well over 1,000 people now. It's a great place to connect with each other and me. And then we've got my store where I sell previously reviewed items that you can buy at a discount. And you can find that link right here. Uh, and we have on that link a email list. So every time I put something on the store, I email everybody to let them know that something new has been added. 
and we'll be getting some stuff up soon because I just started cleaning up the office again. And whenever I go through cleanings, I go through sellings. So be on the lookout. More to come very shortly. And that's going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. I am running out of steam because I am recording this Sunday night at around 11 p.m. So my, uh, my clarity is not quite there at the moment, but I do appreciate you all tuning in. I thank you all for your support and your continued viewership. And please keep those questions and comments coming. More to come next week. I think we're going to commemorate the 25th anniversary of Windows 95 because I think next week is August 24th and it falls on Monday. And that's a great topic for next week's wrap up. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, David Hockman, Brian Parker, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.